was controlling. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, Talk TV uncovers that we've been lining the pockets of fat cat lawyers to help the post office deny postmasters their compensation. We'll speak to a victim of the scandal live. Plus, Rishi Sunak fends off yet another leadership challenge after a former cabinet minister tells Tories to oust him on this show or face a decade of decline under Keir Starmer. And following the XL bully dog ban in England, Talk TV goes on the road with dog owners going to extreme lengths to save their beloved pets. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. We're really getting into our stride this week, and we've got more incredible stories for you tonight. We've got a call to arms. If you won't fight for your country, we don't want you here. We've got a male model mincing around in a bikini who thinks it's perfectly normal. We'll astonish you with a legal bill in the millions for the post office, and we're paying it. And we've got the latest on the Battle of St Pancras. Piano Man has just been on with Piers Morgan, and the Chinese are still fuming. It's a big show, so you'd better be ready. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Stand by your beds. So a single London law firm pocketed a staggering 37.5 million quid to help the post office deny postmasters wronged in the Horizon scandal compensation deal. Talk TV's exclusive investigation discovered that the firm in question, Womble Bond Dixon, represented the post office in civil cases against sub-postmasters, including the heroic Alan Bates, over the course of a decade. I'm joined now by Varchas Patel, whose father, Vipin, is a victim of the post office scandal. Varchas, a very good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. I mean, considering that most of the people who were chased for money and were prosecuted and were made to admit that they'd uh, stolen money were being done for relatively small amounts, weren't they? It was sort of 20,000 here, 25,000 there. And yet they paid this bloody law firm 37.5 million. I mean, it's obscene, um, an obscene um, amount of money. It's a huge sum of money. Um, I just wish uh, the post office were spending these types of monies on actually co on actually compensating all the victims properly and and fully. Um, you know, the post office's relationship with the very expensive lawyers goes back to around two decades, and they will use the most expensive lawyers and ev and even have them pay for arguments which are not even legally valid. No, it is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, the story still rumbles on. Since the last time you, know, you and I spoke, uh, where your father told us and you told us that you've still received no compensation at all, which is incredible. Has anything happened that's changed uh, since we last spoke? No, uh, my father still hasn't received uh, an interim payment, um, though the business minister has, um, if I'm not mistaken, he has advised the Horizon Scandal Board, the advisory board, uh, sh uh, sh shall we say that the so-called five public interest cases, um, including my father, uh, even after their convictions have been quashed, they should be treated um, to to get their full compensation. So essentially, they will be treated exactly the same as everyone else whose convictions ha have been overturned. But no official statement has been made. Uh, my father has not received a penny since, and it's been what, three years and nearly two months? Yeah. Well, no, more importantly than that, we had Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, standing up in the House of Commons to assure everybody that the payments would be made, um, that there were schemes that could be signed up to, and that the idea of the government was to get it all done as quickly as possible. But it doesn't sound like that's what's happened. No. 
I mean, when Mr. Sunak, when when the Prime Minister announced £75,000, I was a bit shocked because, see, most of these claims, if not all, are much larger than £75,000. In fact, let's take, for example, my father, um, his losses that I can calculate, that, that we can calculate just in the financial year of 2010 are in the region of £77,000. Mm. So, you know, to be offering £75,000 um, as potentially full and final. And I must and I must clarify, the details of the £75,000, uh, I have not seen the details and I cannot find, find the details yet. So it, it, it has been a vague statement mm. in my view. Yes. Well, that's the trouble, isn't it? I mean, we've got a government now um, who are getting famous for saying things and not doing mm. them. So we really don't want this to be the case here. Have you been able to uh, speak to any other uh, uh, fellow victims that, that uh, you might have been talking to over the course of the last few years and w whether they've made any progress at all? Um, I mean, I speak to a number of postmasters, um, you know, just on a friendly basis. And overall, generally, uh, most, if not all, have not been fully compensated mm. yet. And those who may may have taken um, some monies, um, in in most cases that I know, may have done that in, in desperation. You see, you know, we can't forget that most, well, a lot of these postmasters were bankrupted. They've lost their business, their homes, uh, assets, savings. Um, they weren't able to, uh, uh, you know, retire working within the post mm. office with a good pension. Um, so I don't believe most of these cases um, have been sorted out properly. No, of course. And finally, have you got a message for these lawyers, these law firms who walked off with £37.5 million of our money, basically, because it was us, the taxpayer, who paid for them? Um, I don't have a message as, as, as such, but I did I did watch Miss, Mr Dilly um, give evidence to the um, post office inquiry about uh, Lee Castleton, and I was horrified. I think one of the comments... Uh, uh, the solicitor in question made was, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Cass Mr. Castleton bankrupted himself. I thought that was very harsh and very mean. Mm, yeah, harsh and mean, I think, are two good words to describe what they've been doing. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's Valches Patel, uh, the son of Vipin, who is still waiting for compensation all these years later, was forced to admit to guilt, despite the fact that he hadn't done anything, um, had a criminal record for many, many years. We've heard all sorts of victims talking over the course of the last few weeks, and many of them having awful stories. With me now, political commentator Candice Holdsworth, an editor at Spikes Online, Tom Slater. And this story just gets worse, doesn't it? You know, yes, they've they've paid out loads of money to people, but it's mostly been to lawyers. When there was when there was a settlement, Tom, back in I think 2019, the first settlement that was made. Half the money, almost, went to the to lawyers representing the post office. It's absolutely outrageous. And as you say, it's not really going to end anytime soon no. either. There are so many victims who still need to be compensated. Also, there's just so many kind of chapters in this story we haven't really learned about right. yet. Even things coming out now about how many government contracts Fujitsu yeah. still has just tells yeah. you how long it's going to be until we properly get some accountability and mm. some justice on this. Exactly right. And Candice, it's right to say, isn't it, that many lives were, were not only ruined, but I heard um, uh, one of the victims talking today, I think, on, on uh, talk today this morning, about how um, children had sort of eating disorders for, for years, that the, 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 the mothers of, of some of those children suffered from stress-related injuries. I mean, health, people's health was affected, people died. They were. It really is amazing. No, it is. I mean, they were ruthlessly hounded mm. by an institution that was so much more powerful than they were. Yeah. And I can't imagine how it must have felt, how they must have almost doubted their own reality. You know, no matter how much they sort of pleaded their case, no one was listening. Yeah. Even though when you get cases like the father and the son, who both took over the post office at different times and then were both accused of the same mm. crime, you would think that the post office would go, hang on a mm. minute, that's weird. Why, is the se why does the same pattern keep emerging? But they didn't. Yeah. And, I mean, the sense of deep, deep injustice that the families must have held, ha must have experienced, not to mention the financial pressure mm. that they were put under. I mean, they lost everything. Yes. And, I mean, we were told um, 
earlier this week that the, the scandal that we also uncovered last week about people being hounded to pay their uh, mm -hmm. television licenses and sometimes being prosecuted for not paying it. Similar kind of idea. Womble Bond Dickinson, this international law firm, is clearly one of these firms that just goes along and waits for the big contract. Mm -hmm. And as long as you get one of those big contracts, you don't have to worry. You can have 50 lawyers working if you're making that kind of money. No, exactly. There's always going to be those kind of unscrupulous ambulance chases in yeah. one way or another. But you just think the amount of people who have profited off of the misery of these sub-postmasters. Yeah. Um, and also, as Candice was saying there, just the fact that people at the post office, at the kind of executive level, didn't even notice that anything was awry. Suddenly, all of these huge amounts of money by a small post office standards yeah. was going missing in a way that had never been seen before. Suddenly, all of these sub-postmasters have become career criminals yes. the night, and yet at no point did they think... Maybe something's gone wrong. No, it's incredible. No. But except no. it now appears, does it not, from, from other in, information that we've had from this inquiry, that there was quite a lot known, that there were people inside mm. of the uh, Horizon organisation, inside Fujitsu, who knew there were faults with the system, mm. who knew that they were making mistakes, and, but it didn't bring them up just... and didn't think that was relevant. I don't know, I'm only speculating. I'm just wondering if they'd invested so much in the software system yeah. that they just could not admit that it wasn't working. Mm. Because I think I'm right in saying that it originally began as a piece of software to deal with kind of paying benefits and stuff. Yeah. It failed and then right. they repurposed it for this. Yes. So from its very inception, it was faulty. Right. And yet they still threw so many And yet they the still went to... through with it. Well, I was uh, again reminded um, of the terrible saga of the NHS. Um, computer systems. Remember, they were going to bring mm. in a new computer system about 2004, mm. um, costing something like two billion. It ended up costing, I think, something like 12 billion, mm. and was eventually dumped in 2012 because it never worked. No. And it was meant to sort of update everybody's computerized medical records. But I mean, the government have a terrible, and all governments, I guess, have a terrible record on mm. any of this stuff. Oh yes, government procurement often fails. It often fails. Does it ever work? No, because as well, they're not subject to, say, the um, market pressures that a private company no. is. The costs are running wildly out of control. You know, you said you, you deliver this on time. I'm going to go out of business. But that doesn't happen with government. More and more money just keeps getting pumped in. Mm, I know. It is absolutely shambolic. Later on in the show, we're going to talk about uh, the army and whether or not, uh, you know, we should be getting national service organised or whether there's ever going to be a war. I mean, I don't know whether you two sort of reacted to that today. Mm. But it was quite a weird uh, reaction that I saw happening from an awful lot of people in this country. Mm -hmm. A lot of young people mm -hmm. saying, why would we bother fighting for this country? You know, it's not the country we want it to be. Mm -hmm. Or it's run by some really, really, really bad people in government. I was quite surprised by that. In a way, I wasn't. I suppose this is a big problem that we've seen in many countries across the West, uh. which is that if you ever poll them about young people in particular, about whether or not you would defend your country, yeah. Uh, it's often quite alarmingly low. And I don't think we can be surprised because we're pumping young young people in particular with a sort of narrative that this is the worst place that's yeah. ever existed. It's really rotten and horrible. Yeah. Racist. Life's awful. Life's awful. We've got a terrible history that we should only atone for. Why would you want to defend that if mm. that's the kind of story you've been told for yeah. most of your young adults? Well, I guess that's the schools are to blame for all Maybe. that. Maybe. I mean, I'm reading a book, though, that's about crisis points in history. Yeah. And what's so fascinating about it is it says every generation that has to confront a big existential crisis mm. feels completely ill-equipped to do so. Yes. That we would... Ne how can we be told... To how can we be asked to do this? We don't have the strength of prior generations. Mm. But when you actually have to, and you have to defend your country, and you have to defend everything you love, you do it. Yeah. And you actually discover that you can do it. Well, we'll explore all this stuff later on, because I wonder whether it's just because people have become so comfortable and so cosy, mm. which is why I think there's things like Just Stop Oil and people worry about stuff which they really shouldn't be worried about, because mm. they've got nothing else to worry about, yes. effectively. We'll be talking about Greenpeace coming up a little bit later on as well. Um, thank you very much for the meantime, though. We'll have you back very shortly. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up, an XL bully lover tells Talk TV today how he spent thousands of pounds driving the dogs to Scotland as police shoot dead. Another one of those devil dogs. Do not go anywhere barking. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. 
Officer Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now, oh, no. uh, <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the Mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great Mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that been... is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. XL bully dog owners are resorting to extreme lengths to circumvent a recent ban on the breed in England and Wales, in some cases sending their pets hundreds of miles to Scotland where the dogs are still actually legal. But as Oliver Whitfield Mearchich reports, the animals' futures north of the border will only be a temporary fix. Good boy. Meet Phil Gregory an XL bully owner who travels any distance for the now outlawed dogs blamed for the deaths of at least 23 people. When the ban came into force in England and Wales, it became illegal to have an XL bully in public without a lead and muzzle. It's also against the law to sell, breed or give the dogs away. A lot of the dogs I'm, I'm getting are actually coming from breeders that know there's no money left in it and they're either dumping them or putting them to sleep. But in Scotland, a loophole emerged when the devolved government originally said it wasn't planning on a ban. So on Boxing Day, Phil made the first of more than 40 trips up north to rehome dogs. Hello. When I go to Scotland, it's like a round trip, about 700 miles. And I've, I've done that so many times, so at least 20,000 miles. A Scotland run is like 250 pounds. I think I've spent over 4,000 pounds so far, I think. Now, the Scottish government has had a change of heart and will replicate the ban in England and Wales, in part because of the influx in arrivals. Mike Flynn is the chief superintendent of the Scottish SPCA. What is your message to those people who are driving to Scotland with XL Bully Dogs? My simple message would be don't, because we're going to end up with the same laws up here. If the owners in England and Wales are so concerned, I think they've still got about a week left to um, apply for an exemption, apply for it, uh, comply with the conditions and you can keep your dog. Phil concedes that when the breed is fully banned in Scotland, his journeys might have to be made in reverse or even abroad. Yet that won't stop him. Just look at this, that's, that's what motivates you. They're beautiful. I just, got, I just need to keep going. Undeterred, he once again loads an XL bully into his car for a 10 hour round trip to Lockerbie before the Scottish ban begins. Oliver Whitfield-Mircic, Talk TV.
Joining me tonight, we've got dog behaviourist Hannah Malloy. Hello, Hannah, how are you? Hello, Mike. I'm all right. How are you? Very well indeed. It's a strange uh, situation, this, isn't it? Because you've got people in Scotland who apparently are able to own this dog, able to have a sort of any um, a permutation of, of an XL bully, which a lot of them seem to be anyway. Um, and yet, you know, just across a sort of fictitious border, um, if you take one over that border, uh, you could be in trouble. That's it. We're in a really weird period of time where it is illegal to own one in one half uh, of this, well, in England, and, and it's not illegal to own one in Scotland. Um, and I completely understand why we're seeing this situation play out. People are desperate to do anything they can to save these dogs' lives. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, there are still loads of attacks and it does seem that Scotland is going to go the same way as England and decide to bring the ban in in Scotland. And I can kind of understand why it would be a weird loophole to have a large part um, of an island mm. that was OK with the ban and the other half of the island not OK with the ban. But it's yeah, it's, it's a really difficult situation. Uh, rehoming a dog is not something that should be done lightly. Um, rehoming should have lots of checks and processes put in place to make sure that people who are taking on a dog are ready to do that, are the right person. So this kind of sort of desperate rehoming attempt um, is likely to, to go a little bit wrong when done at speed. Well, that's the trouble, isn't it? And, I mean, was it done at speed? I mean, the trouble is, I suppose, uh, those who made the, the, the law would say, well, if we hadn't done it at speed, people would have said, well, why didn't you do it quicker? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I would say that the law absolutely has been a knee-jerk reaction, but equally I appreciate we are currently living in an era where we have dogs that have both the capacity and the tenacity to do serious damage to humans. Mm. I would argue as an animal behaviourist that that is because of the way those dogs have been raised and treated, but I'm not denying that they have the physical ability to, to really harm people, and that's mm. something that we need to, as a country, uh, do a lot more to safeguard against. Yes. The other problem I have, though, is the media is not picking up on all of the other dog attacks, and it isn't just dogs who look like this who are right. attacking humans at the moment, and that's really important no, too. No, I think that's a problem. I mean, I was told a story, I think, a week or two ago about an attack that happened up in Manchester uh, of an Alsatian, I think it was, that attacked somebody's smaller dog and basically killed mm. the dog. And the police came along, yeah. shot the Alsatian, who until that moment had been relatively calm and, and, and normal and, and a very good pet. And, and obviously the, the, the both owners were absolutely distraught because it was a horrible scene. And it all went on in the daytime, in public, on a sort of public street. Absolutely. And dog on dog attacks are even more nuanced and complicated than dog on human attacks. We have a pretty strong line when it comes to dogs attacking people. Mm. That's just not OK. Right. Dogs attacking dogs is much more complicated. Right. We have to understand their language um, to be able to really understand what happens between uh, dog on dog attacks. If a dog kills another dog, though, uh, I do think there needs to be better measures. And there was a story just the other day of a golden retriever um, who mauled a child at a birthday party. Right. So, you know, it isn't just dogs like XL bullies, although I appreciate um, that they can do a lot more damage yeah. than other breeds. And what happened to that golden retriever? Was that destroyed as well? Yeah, I believe so. And, I, you know, and this is the difficulty is we don't get to see all of the other... We don't get to see the whole spectrum of what's happening in the UK. Right. And my concern is that if we continue focusing on the XL bully and, and everything that owners who have dogs that look like this are currently... They're stressing out. They've got a week. Mm. If you think that your dog is an XL bully type, you have just one week uh, to get it on the exemption scheme. Or someone could you know, point at your dog and say, I think that's an XL yeah. bully and the police would come around. So there's tens of thousands of people in the UK right now who are stressing out yeah. because they're worrying that their best friend might be considered an XL or a pit bull. Right. Um, but that's so, another weird thing, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, who is going to come around? Who will knock on the door? Who will be responsible for sort of policing all of this if you have got a dog that is thought to be uh, in breach of this new rule? I mean, up in Scotland, it was just on Tuesday, I think, um, there was a man taken to hospital with serious injuries, uh, a large bulldog-type dog, but it was not yet known whether it was an XL bully. And that was shot as well. Yeah. And that had been brought up from England, actually, yeah. I believe. That dog was one of those quick rehomes. And this is the problem. If you rescue a dog 
Um, we always say with rescue, three days, three weeks, three months. These are our timing points. So when you get a dog home, within three days, it knows its environment. Within three weeks, it knows you. And within three months, you know it. Right. Okay, so there's just not enough time. We're not giving dogs enough time to settle in, to get to know their caregivers. Um, and in this case, this gentleman had taken on a dog he who was brought up because of the ban mm. um, and was horribly attacked by it uh, within a week of owning it. So, you know, we really just need to be so much more careful um, when it comes to rehoming and training dogs. Absolutely. And I would say across the board, mm. I want to see a dog license come in. You've heard me say it before, Mike, and I will say it again. We need dog licensing across the board for all dogs. We yeah. need much higher standards of training. So that I could, you know, turn to a dog and, and say, listen, can you call your dog for me? Yeah. If you can't call your dog within three calls and have it come immediately back, then you're going to lose the uh, the license to have your dog off lead. Yes. You know, things like this are going to totally change the landscape of Great Britain if we would just step in and, and do do all of the dogs. <laughs> yeah. We don't want them all on the muzzles. I don't think that's necessary, but we could have much higher standards of training across the board. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, the difficulty with all of these types of situations, you know, it's like people who break the law as a reg on a regular basis. If horrible people own dogs, the dogs are likely to be badly behaved and badly trained and possibly dangerous. But those horrible people will remain horrible and they probably will never really change you know same as people who drive without insurance the same as people who are going to break into your house you can keep warning them that they're doing something against the law but are they really going to stop doing it and this is where we need much better strategies um, for talking to people who fall into that category i was speaking to a dog licensing officer the other day and this particular person said to me honey you know the people that i meet who have the dogs that i'm trying to keep away from the public these are people who would take a puppy and go and get it put down to claim the 200 quid from the right. government you know and so there's there are so many wonderfully responsible dog owners out there and there is a huge contingent of people who honestly are living in poverty mm. and social poverty and uh, emotional poverty don't have any sense of responsibility towards their community we really need to be thinking of much more novel strategies uh, to help people like this look after dogs well uh, or just not be getting given them in the first place. Right, right. <laughs> not OK. Exactly. Um, but as you say, I mean, I know it's a slightly bigger problem, but those communities where a lot of those people live have got big problems, huge problems, that need to be addressed as well. And the dogs are just part of it, really. But, Hannah, listen, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Hannah Malloy, their dog behaviour, is saying, you know... It's not going to be that simple. Nobody really knows. I mean, are you actually going to be expecting to report somebody as having an XL bully dog and expect somebody to turn up the next day to take it away? Really? I'd be amazed if that actually worked. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, Tory MP breaking ranks to call for another change in leadership. It was drama on the show last night. But does Britain have the appetite for a fourth prime minister in five years? Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Oh, now oh, look. Taller. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the Mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great Mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. 
This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that been... is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Rishi Sunak spent the day fighting off questions from Labour over turmoil in the Tory party after Simon Clark called for the Prime Minister to be ousted. Clark's comments have received no public backing within the Conservative ranks, and on this very programme last night, Tobias Elwood was the first to come out in support of Sunak. I mean, this is ridiculous. I think so many parliamentarians party members, and indeed the nation will be shocked uh, to listen to Simon Clark and what he is saying. Let's press forward. Let's you know show some discipline. Let's, uh, I think, exhibit the fact that we want to take this election seriously. I hope very quickly um, that the parliamentarians, my colleagues, will line up uh, to dismiss what Simon is doing. And that was just after 10 o'clock last... 9 o'clock last night, I should say, when we started the show. I don't think anyone was that surprised that Tobias Elwood didn't want to see a different leader to Rishi Sunak. Uh, but joining me now is Telegraph journalist Stephen Edgington. Steve, very good evening to you. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. I mean, you would expect Tobias Elwood to say that, as he did last night. But what I was quite surprised about was by the time the show was coming to an end, about sort of half past 10, quarter to 11, it appeared that, uh, that the Clark manoeuvre had literally gone nowhere and even people like Liz Truss were distancing herself from him. Well, it's interesting you say Clark manoeuvre, because was it a manoeuvre or was it something else? I think he didn't really consult other Conservative mm. MPs before he wrote the piece. Yeah. And I think there's a really interesting line that he said, and I think it's worth quoting. No one likes the guy who is shouting, shouting iceberg, mm. but I suspect that people will be even less happy if we hit the iceberg and we are on course to do that. So I think I can completely understand why Conservative MPs like Tobias Elwood are coming in and saying, we must be loyal, we must right. get behind the Prime Minister, we must be uni united behind this man before the general election. But from Simon Clark's point of view, and I think I can understand this, Conservative MPs are heading for complete disaster mm. in the general election. If you look at all the opinion polls, they're going to be completely wiped out if you, you, know, if you believe them. So why shouldn't they replace the leader? That's Simon Clark's perspective. Yeah. Whether he's right on that, I don't know. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at him actually saying those words, because he was speaking to the BBC earlier today. What would not be responsible is for the Conservative Party to continue on what I think is a glide path to a catastrophic defeat unless we find a message which connects better. No one likes the guy who's shouting iceberg, but I suspect that people will be even less happy if we hit the iceberg, and uh, we are on course to do that. So, is he the only one that sees the iceberg, continuing with the iceberg analogy? Because, I mean, funnily enough, one of the things Tobias Elwood said last night, and I've heard others say, is that, oh, no, there are other polls, you know. There are some polls that don't show us quite so far behind. There are some polls that show uh, that the, the, the gap is narrowing. And it's almost like they're involved in some kind of mass delusion. I think they're sort of trying to convince themselves that it's not as bad as it looks. It's really interesting. Simon uh, Clark talks about an iceberg and yeah. a Titanic kind of reference. Yeah. I think a better analogy <clears throat> is actually 1940, the 10th of May, in France. Mm. And after the Germans invade, what you have in the French leadership 
is, is three separate camps. You have the people at the top who are basically denying that disaster is going to happen. Mm. You have the people who understand that the disaster is going to happen, but they're um, simply manoeuvring for after the yeah. disaster happens. And you have the people who want radical change and want to fight back. And right. I think Simon Clark is in that latter camp, right. where you have some Conservative MPs who are, lo who are looking at the polling. I think they all understand, basically, that this is going to be a complete disaster for the mm. Conservative Party, other than some people who are number 10, who genu genuinely believe that they can somehow turn it around. I don't know how they think they can do yeah. that. Um, so there are, obviously, I think most Conservative MPs look at the situation now and think, well, I think the disaster is inevitable. Mm. We've had 10 years, or more than 10 years in power, and all of the issues that Simon Clark talked about in his fantastic Telegraph piece are down to us. Yeah. Record immigration, record tax levels, record spending, record debt. This is all on the Conservative yeah. Party. And again, this is the weakness in Simon's argument is, well, you should replace Rishi Sunak, but with A, with who, and B, what would happen to that leader in terms of the record yeah. that I've just talked well, about? Well, I mean, if you want to continue with the Titanic analogy, it's basically like rearranging the deck chairs, isn't it? So you literally still are heading for the iceberg. There's not much you can do about it. It's a very big ship. You can't turn it around in time, and you're going down no matter what. But there are some people, of course, who say, hang on a minute, um, this is the same Simon Clark who called for unity only a year ago, um, who said, let's all get behind Rishi Sunak. So has he had some kind of road to Damascus conversion? The thing that I found surprising was, as I say, knowing that he was supposed to be involved in this pop con um, announcement next week, that I assumed when he wrote that piece for the Telegraph, he must have cleared it with them or said, you know, this is what I'm planning to do, what do you think? So that at least some of the MPs, which I thought to be in about 100 of them, who believe in this conservative drive for more conservative member, members of the Conservative Party to be conservative, you would have thought that he would have had some of those um, on his side, but he seems to have none of them. Now, it looks like he didn't consult mm. with the popcorns Which before. is kind of mad, isn't it? Which is a bit mad. Yeah. I mean, but if you're thinking, of, let's say Simon Clark really did have a principled conversion on this and he yeah. felt that it was a very... I mean, I think last night when he was... Just after he published the column, apparently he was at the football, if you read Robert's pessimism. Yes. Picture. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think he's... Uh, it might be one of those situations where this really is just an individual mm. going out there and going on a, on a whim and sort of... And, you know, he's really had, a, as I say, a principled conversion. Yeah. I think also... This whole thing is very political, isn't it? But actually, yeah. when you look at the issues facing the country, the issues that I mentioned, particularly things like the immigration levels mm. to the UK, we're seeing huge amounts of illegal immigration this year. This year, it's happening right now. Yes. So I think it's understandable that... Ho I would hope that some Conservative MPs would look at the situation and say, we do need a radical change. Right. What Rishi's doing is a complete disaster. He's not uh, fixing the issues that are facing the country. We do need a change in leadership. Yeah. And I can understand from that perspective, you know, in terms of outcomes and the problems facing Britain, it's clearly not working. Well, this is Rishi it. I mean, I've that. spoken to some of the PopCon people and they're talking about a literal revolution. They're saying, you know, the whole problem in this country is that... You know, the civil service is impossible to get through. Um, all of the kind of uh, uh, the creative um, brains behind the Tony Blair project of the Supreme Court have ruined uh, the parliament's ability to make laws properly. You know, the judiciary is, is holed below the waterline full of lefties. You know, they're talking in these kind of terms that the only way to improve this country is to basically tear it all down and start again. I can completely understand that perspective, and I'm so sympathetic, mm. and actually, this is... I, I don't disagree with any of that. Well, this is the independent republic of Mike Graham. It is. And I know that you would make a far better leader <laughs> slash dictator yes. of Britain. I don't know, Trump talks about being a dictator. Yeah. Um, well, there's some good things about being a benign dictator. I mean, sometimes offering people a choice isn't a good idea. I think that the situation we've got with our democracy at the moment, we do not live in a real democracy. No. As you say, the civil service, all of these institutions mm. act independently of what ministers tell them to do in many right. cases. Although, having said all that, I think let's not abdicate the responsibility from the Conservative Party, from Conservative ministers, from yeah. Conservative MPs, who have had the chance over the last 14, 13 years to reform the state. They have had the chance and the ability and the opportunity to undo the reforms that Tony Blair enacted when he was Prime yeah. Minister. And they haven't and done And they it. haven't done it. And they need to be honest about that. Yes. And I think that's why they are really heading for electoral... And the defeat. problem is, is they've got people like Tobias Elwood who probably don't want them to change those things, and that is part of the problem. But let's have a look, shall we, at what happened to Prime Minister's questions today uh, to see whether, in whether indeed Rishi Sunak survived it, because it should have been an easy win for Keir Starmer. So was he surprised to see one of his own MPs say that he doesn't get what Britain needs and he's not listening to what people want? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. S Mr Speaker, he talks about 
what Britain needs, what Britain wants, what Britain values. This from a man who takes the knee, Mr Speaker, who wanted to abolish the monarchy, who still doesn't know what a woman is. I mean, he's got a point, hasn't he? I mean, Starmer still has a weakness, and he has many weaknesses. I mean, like his original attack this week based upon the fact that wokery is all in the minds of Tories, that they've somehow invented um, things to go to battle over because they want a culture war. When everybody knows that part of the problems uh, that exist in this country are because we've got so much diversity and inclusivity and, you know, equity and all of these ludicrous kind of um, Stonewall-inspired rules that every company and every uh, public service uh, organisation has to run on. Well, we've just talked about how the Conservatives don't have the ability or the solutions mm. to the huge problems facing Britain. And I think that, you know, you're very much right in that Keir Starmer does, equally does not have those solutions no. to the problems facing the country. Whether that, as, as you say, whether that's wokeism in various mm. different institutions, including the National Trust, and I'm sorry, the National Trust is woke. Of course it he, is. We're not lying about this. I mean, no. Keir Starmer is completely gaslighting the British public right. on this whole issue, and this is what he's going to do when he's Prime Minister. Mm. So I'm not optimistic about Keir Starmer in government. No. I think he will do what the Conservatives have done, but probably 10%, maybe 15% worse mm. or more uh, than the Conservatives have done the last 14 years. So, basically, expect more of the same, but a bit worse. Right. Is it likely that there's some group, as you were saying, like the, uh, in that French situation in 1940, yeah. who think that they might be able to limit the damage, i.e., yes, we're going to lose the election, but it won't be a massive landslide, and therefore Labour won't be as powerful, they won't be able to do everything they want to do, will be able to limit their uh, abilities, they'll have to get into bed with the SNP or something like that. So is that a possibility? I think there is a possibility that Labour, if they don't achieve a significant majority, that party is divided. Mm. And at the moment, they look united because they're heading into a general election, they're desperate for power. Normally, you know, the opposition party can quite easily do that. And when you're in government, suddenly all those divisions mm. um, will come alive and, and sort of a, a light will be shone on, yes. on them. So I think that, you know, I'll take a, a good example is on Gaza. Yeah. So you've seen splits in the Labour Party on, their, on Keir Starmer's yeah. response to Gaza. Mm. And I think that you'll see much more of this when and if they get into government. Yeah. And it will be harder for, for Keir to enact his policies because of these splits in the Labour Party right. that don't seem to be apparent now. Having said all that, the civil service is clearly on Keir Starmer's side. Mm. The BBC is clearly on Keir Starmer's side. Yeah. So Labour have huge institutional advantages, unlike the Conservative Party, because they have all of these massive kind of woke institutions and the so-called mm. establishment basically politically on side. Yes, but it might be their own party that trips them up in that case. Steve, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Steve will be back a little bit later on with the rest of the panel, of course. You're watching The Independent Republican Mike Graham. Up next, they're at it again. Listen up, Israel and Hamas. Social justice warriors Greenpeace are calling for a ceasefire. You'll get The Independent Republic's take on this mob next. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the Mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great Mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, and persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for Taking the Mic. It seems like ages since we saw anyone from Just Stop Oil, doesn't it? No orange-vested Herberts holding up the traffic. No old grannies complaining the fish are dying in their ponds. No Tarquins and Philomenas wailing through loud hailers that we're facing extinction in a few years if we don't stop drilling for oil. Come to think of it, Extinction Rebellion have been pretty much disappearing from view as well. I'm sure they've morphed into all kinds of weird knockoffs like Animal Rebellion. They seem to spend most of their time emptying milk cartons in posh London department store food halls. But no marches for ages. I was beginning to wonder if they might have all decided to pack it in. You know, actually get jobs, actually go to work instead of living off mummy and daddy and their millions. But I was wrong. They have not disappeared at all. It's just been a bit cold. It's a pity, though, because they could have taken the opportunity to say we're having so many storms, one after the other, because of climate change. I mean, it's a no-brainer for them, isn't it? Surely Jocelyn and Aisha must have been inspired by my driving habits and all those planes flying around in circles the other night. But who wants to glue themselves to a bank when there's a howling gale going on? Who wants to sit on the road when it's battering down with torrential hail and rain? If they weren't such utter hypocrites and charlatans, I might even feel sorry for them. But today, I see they've decided to go after a different cause. Forget the climate, because now the eco-nutters have decided it's a ceasefire they want. But not in Yemen, not in Ukraine, mind you, and not even in South Sudan. No, no. They want a ceasefire in Gaza, the trendy lefty cause for all good socialists. I suppose we should have seen it coming. It was Greta Thunberg who took a day off from her climate obsession at the end of last year to assure us that what we really needed was a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to the killing of innocents, as lefties describe Hamas fighters. Although I don't remember her calling for the release of the hostages. Today, Greenpeace decided to follow her lead. They clambered up the side of the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, which houses Picasso's famous Guernica painting, but they weren't calling for politicians to be prosecuted for failing to save the planet. Nothing as mundane as that. Oh, no. Instead, they unfurled a banner with some difficulty, it must be said, which read, cease fire now beneath a poster that showed a distressed child in Gaza and a message, can you hear us? Naturally, the police did nothing about it. They simply watched alongside some local firefighters. They might as well have applauded them. Obviously, in Spain, they're just as woke as our lot. Once again, there was no banner that said, bring them home for the hostages, and no mention of them at all, despite more than 130 of them still being held and tortured in those horrific underground tunnels. Proof, if you needed it, that these bloody eco-nuts are nothing more than Marxist terrorist sympathisers. Just remember, that's the next time they stop traffic. Now, advocates for victims of paedophile pop star Gary Glitter want to see the 79-year-old remain behind bars, don't we all? The singer, whose real name is Paul Gadd, faced a parole hearing behind closed doors today. The authorities are now weighing up whether he serves the rest of his 16-year sentence for abusing three schoolgirls or is again allowed back on the streets. Glitter was previously released in February last year after serving half of his term, 
but was taken back to prison after breaching licence conditions by supposedly and allegedly viewing downloaded images of children. Joining me now is one of those advocates and lawyer for one of Clitter's victims, Richard Scorer. Richard, uh, very good evening to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, I'm assuming because that hearing today was behind closed doors, we don't know what happened and, and I presume no decision has yet been made. Uh, we don't know what happened and uh, we're not aware of any decision yet, obviously. Um, as soon as we, we find out, we can comment on that. But, you know, we very much hope that the right decision will be made. And I think the only sensible decision... Yeah, I'm afraid, Richard, we've got a bit of a problem with your connection. We'll try and get a better connection back. One of the things that we've actually heard from the parole hearing uh, is that Gary Glitter doesn't appear to have shown any remorse at all. I mean, this is uh, some footage of him uh, going into the court, obviously. This is a guy who, let's not forget, when he was released last February, turned up in some kind of um, um, sort of halfway house, if you like, and he was spotted hanging around places that he probably shouldn't have been hanging around. I think we've got Richard back on a slightly better connection. Richard, sorry, we were uh, rudely interrupted there. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was asking you if, if, if we're likely to know yeah. what, what is going to be a decision anytime soon. Well, I mean, we, we don't know what the decision is yet. I think there can be only one, uh, you know, decision in this case, only one sensible decision, which is to keep him behind bars. Uh, I mean, you mentioned about his his re you know his attempts to reoffend when he came out last time. So you know we know that he hasn't changed in that respect, and we we also know actually because we've been trying to deal with him directly in a case which my client has brought against him, a civil case, a claim for damages, that he has shown absolutely no remorse, mm. and we we tried to put some evidence before the parole board on that issue. So, you know, he hasn't changed. He is the same man as he always was, the same monster as he always was, and he needs to remain locked up. Yes. I mean, we've seen this in other cases, haven't we? Um, Colin Pitchfork's case, which is different, I know, uh, but he was sent to jail for uh, a very long time for the murder and rape of two 15-year-old schoolgirls um, a couple of years apart, I think it was. Um, but it seems to me incredible that the parole board seemingly alone out of everything that else that goes on around them, seems to see these individuals as uh, in need of uh, being freed and, and being rehabilitated in some way. Pitchfork, similarly, was uh, apprehended pretty soon after he was released because he was hanging around outside a primary school. You know, Gary Glitter is one of those characters who's never going to change. As you say, in his entire life, he's never shown any remorse, has he? We, we have to uh, deal with the reality that when you're look, talking about serious sex offenders, serious paedophiles, serious child abusers, uh, you know, the vast majority of them, almost without exception, will never change. They are unreformable. And that is absolutely the case with uh, Gary Glitter. It's the case with Colin Pitchfork as well. And I think there is a degree of naivety around that. And I wish that people would just understand this. I mean, I, I've been dealing with these, these terrible abuse cases for a couple of decades, and it's very obvious that these people are, are, are not capable of being reformed. And we have to recognise that. There have been sex offender treatment programmes in prison. Actually, when you look at the track record of those, most of them don't work. And in fact, some of them, actually, when you analyse it, make the, the situation worse, seemingly. So, um, you know, the, the reality is that these people are not capable of change. And we, we have to stop basing decision making on the idea that they are. Mm. Exactly right. And I've always said, if particularly uh, in his case and in other cases as well, if they've already been recalled once, it seems to me that that's a pretty good indication um, that the last time you let them out, uh, it didn't work. So why would you bother doing it again? Well, I completely agree. And it's completely unfair on victims, including my client, that we have to have this circus again and again. As you say, the reality is the last time he came out, it was very obvious that he was trying to reoffend uh, and reoffend very quickly or get yeah. into a situation at least where he could look at pictures of children uh, and get onto the dark web and so on. So, you know, his, his instincts remain that exactly the same as they always were. And it ought to be obvious that the risk um, is there and continues to be there and he shouldn't be let out. Now, that, you know, that is obvious, I think, to most people. I just hope that that's obvious to the parole board. Yes. And, I mean, the Pro Board is a very sort of um, mysterious organisation, isn't it? And I know mm. that there are certain reasons why that has to be the case. And I know that, um, you know, perhaps what we don't want is, is people trying to find out who's on the Pro Board and what decisions they're making to try and influence them. But surely there must be some legal um, safeguard that can be put on certain individuals like Gary Glitter, uh, like Pitchfork, you know, who 
absolutely, if they are released and they are then taken back in, that should be the end of it, that they should then serve their entire sentence, or possibly even some have suggested, go back to the beginning of the sentence. You know, so if Glitter was given 16 years in prison, um, he goes back to the beginning of 16 years. Well, I, I would I would certainly like to see something like that. And, you know, the, the, the point about release halfway through the sentence is that it was based on the idea you know, that, that you, you try to reform the prisoner and sort of slowly integrate them back into right. society. Now, there will be some prisoners, you know, for whom that's true, and you can do that, but not serious sex offenders, uh, not people like this. And so, you know, the idea that you, you apply this kind of, um, you know, halfway release um, principle mm. to, to, you know, to, to all of the all, all offenders, irrespective of how, how serious the offence is, I think is completely misconceived and wrong. We, we have to revisit that. I mean, we, we have to look at this again, because I think that this kind of um, situation we've got at the moment with somebody like Gary Glitter actually um, massively undermines public confidence mm. in, in the system. And rightly so. You know, people, people look at this and they ask the sort of questions you've been asking and they think that the system is messed up and, and they're right to feel that way. Yeah, and similarly for the for the case of the killers of, of Jamie Bulger, you know, surely the parole yeah. board offers and should offer the rest of society a duty of care, you know, to let dangerous individuals um, who are going to likely harm other people and possibly children, you know, I, I would say that that's a huge responsibility and one that they should take more seriously and they should not even countenance the idea that if there's any, a sliver of a chance that another offence could be committed, there should be no way they get out. Yes, and I think that, you know, going back to your point about, about the hearings and, and the way parole board hearings happen and the fact that they're kind of shrouded in mystery and, and secrecy, I think that's completely wrong. And, you, you know, you make the point about you've got to protect the, you know, the, 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 the safety of parole yeah. board members and so on. But there are ways in which you can configure hearings so that it is actually possible for the public to see, you know, what information is being presented in general terms and how that information is being assessed. And I think that's really important. You know, we we're supposed to have in this country a principle of open justice, and it is completely wrong that everything that happens in the parole situation always happens behind closed doors. I mean, the parole board made a, a public commitment a few years ago after the War Boys case, which you will remember, yes. um, to try to uh, improve transparency. The reality is that that has never happened. That mm. commitment has not been uh, honoured. And I, and I think, you know, that is a real problem. Yeah, absolutely right. Richard, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Richard Scorer there, uh, representing one of the victims of Gary Glitter, who, as I said uh, earlier on, certainly does not want to see him coming out again and is actually going after him for some civil damages as well. Let's hope she's successful because the parole board really needs to be much more efficient at what it does and much better at looking after the rest of the public rather than anything else. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. The chief of the British Army warns Brits they could be called up to fight for their country. So are the younger generation ready to answer the call? They bloody better be. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Oh, now oh, look. Taller. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. It's like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that been... is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're still on your smart speaker. Coming up, your country needs you. The chief of the British Army has warned Brits that they could be called up to fight in the event of war. The government is reportedly considering a new 99% mortgage scheme. Our man Paul Champlina will tell us what that means. And budget blowout. The UK's flagship Hinkley Point nuclear plant has hit, been hit with further delays and could end up costing up to £35 billion. <sighs> That's expensive. Now, earlier this week, I brought you an exclusive interview with the pianist Brendan Kavanagh. Well, the videos of this series of unfortunate events have now been seen over six million times online and prompted literally thousands of comments from supporters around the world, praising Dr K for standing up for freedom and refusing to be censored. Let's remind ourselves of what happened. Kavanagh was confronted by a group of Chinese tourists who demanded that he didn't share videos showing their faces or voices online. The catch is that he was filming in a public place, playing Elton John's piano in London's St Pancras train station, which has now been cordoned off, of course, apparently for maintenance work. The police got involved as well. An officer tried to tell Brendan not to look and not to film. Take a look. They've requested that the video where they've approached gets deleted and not used on your channel. No, they because don't Because there's money being made and they work for our company, then their faces can't be shown. Must well, they shouldn't be. In, in, if that's, you're not their private security agent. I'm not their private okay. security agent. And we're in a free country, we're in a free space, we're not causing any trouble. The problem is not from us, Kerry. The problem is they are coming over, telling us what to do, and playing the piano. Now, fair is fair, but you are not their private security guard. We're not in China. And that's not racist, that's the truth. That's what our exactly, forefathers thought. Exactly, but you can't say things like that either. You can't just say things say like what? that. Say what? That we're in a free country? No, but we're not in China. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? She walks away eventually, uh, as did the Chinese people. Brendan pointed out their hypocrisy on this show on Monday. They wanted complete privacy in a station where there was thousands of people and, uh, you know, that everyone's there filming and uh, they want complete privacy. They don't want anyone filming them. They don't want to be known. And they were going around waving these yellow Chinese anti-disclosure things. Right. And <laughs> so they said it's an extremely sensitive issue. The guy is very, very sensitive. I mean, for goodness sake, now he's a YouTube star. Right. <laughs> On last night's show, uh, we had the spectator Cindy Yu giving her reaction, which has now gone viral as well. And you can watch that over on our Talk TV YouTube channel. Now, of course, Brendan was on Piers Morgan uh, uncensored tonight, and uh, I spoke to him before he went on, and he said to me that they're still trying to take down his original video, uh, which is sitting on YouTube, having had millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of views. Uh, so we'll keep tabs on uh, Brendan, because he's fighting the good fight uh, against what seems to be a rather malevolent sort of force of people trying to keep things secret and trying to stop us here in Britain, in our own country, from publishing things.
Oh, very strange. Now, later on in the show, we'll bring you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. And they've got a story on the front page which I don't really understand. Uh, it's a strictly exclusive, uh, not a show that I watch. Ellie's secret dates with Bobby. Strictly winner Ellie Leach and EastEnder Bobby Brazier have been enjoying secret dates together, uh, apparently the Sun can reveal. The ex Corrie actress, who's 22, and fan fave Bobby, who's 20, have set tongues wagging, says the Sun, by holding hands on the Strictly tour coach. Now, apparently, uh, Bobby uh, is the son of Jade Goody, I'm told. A source said the chat is that they've had a cheeky snog and will go public with the romance any week now. Well, possibly uh, tomorrow, once this comes out on the front page of the Sun. They've got a good Harry and Meghan story, which we'll talk to you about a little bit later on as well, when the panel return and we bring you all the news that's fit to print and some of it that isn't. Now, uh, let us talk about what we must be prepared to do because we, the British public, must be prepared to brave the battlefield and fight for our country if NATO goes to war with Russia. So suggest reports uh, commented by the Chief of the General Staff of the Army, General Sir Patrick Sanders. Our full-time army currently stands at a somewhat puny 75,983, but that's set to fall to 72,500, and the Navy and the RAF are struggling with recruitment and retention too. I'm joined now by retired British Army officer Major General Tim Cross and Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Very good evening to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. I mean, recruitment um, is at an all-time low. Um, I've been quite shocked, uh, Tim, to hear today that an awful lot of people, uh, particularly young people, don't seem to think the country's worth fighting for. They think that the government's not very good. They think that the country is in a terrible state. And they don't really fancy actually going to war to save it. Yeah, well, I have a certain amount of sympathy with them because um, the media, amongst others, continually throws out that we should be embarrassed by our history, that um, particularly white young men are, you know, not, not the favoured child and uh, that people are, are embarrassed about all sorts of aspects. I mean, recruiting is very poor, but it's linked, I think, to the fact that the government have been reducing the size of the military now for quite a long time, since the end of the Cold War, obviously, but even in the last few years we've come down from around 105,000. So the message going out to younger people is, this is not an organisation that is expanding, it's reducing, and therefore opportunities for career and so forth in the military is probably not what it was before. They are a different generation. I don't, I don't go along with this idea that they are, you know, not as good as previous generations, but they're a different generation, they're receiving different messages, and, uh, and recruiting is definitely suffering. I have to say partly because I don't think it's been well handled by the company that have got charge... Uh, Capita, who took on responsibility right. for recruiting some years ago. Well, I think uh, it may well be as well that things have all taken a bit of a turn for the woke. Uh, let's talk to Isabel Oakshaw. Isabel, uh, thanks very much for joining us. I mean, one of the problems I would have thought that the army and the armed forces in general suffer from is that they've been infected, like the rest of the country, uh, with this kind of diversity and inclusivity mantra, uh, which has meant that they've had to hire loads and loads of people that might not be as good at what they supposedly will be doing, and it might put a lot, an awful lot of people off. I mean, I've seen a lot of comments today from people saying, well, you know, they don't really want young uh, British men to do anything male or in any way masculine, so it's hardly surprising. Maybe we should just fight uh, with all the rest of the people that they like so much to recruit. Well, I'd like to make a link with the news item that you carried earlier about the pianist yeah. who was confronted by the policewoman because a bunch of Chinese people with stupid placards took it upon themselves to say that in our country, we shouldn't be doing what they didn't yeah. want us to do. With the very great irony that China is one of the most highly surveilled states on the planet. Right. And yet our police saw fit to actually reprimand the pianist, mm. the British pianist who was entertaining passengers in the station and he wasn't apparently allowed to say, um, this isn't China, right. which is just a <laughs> statement of fact. Right. Now, why is that relevant to the conversation we're having? Well, because if you're asking people to sign up and put their lives on the line, potentially, they're entitled to ask the question, for what and for whom? And we have so lost sight and any sense of our national identity, of who we are, and complete disunity has taken over because we have imported at a completely unprecedented rate people from so many different cultures that I think it's going to become very difficult, increasingly so, to persuade people 
to sign up for these jobs, which are still a, an amazing career, when they're just not sure what they would be potentially risking their lives for, who we are anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, Tim, let me come back to you on that one because I remember when the Falklands War was on. I'm old enough to remember it, sadly. And uh, I was in my very early 20s and I was very, very enthused about the idea of actually signing up and going down to the Falklands and fighting on behalf of Britain. And an awful lot of people um, that were my age at the time felt the same way. And in some ways, that battleground kind of identified Britain in and of itself at that time, as did Margaret Thatcher kind of make it her own. And I don't see any similarities now today. I don't see sort of, you know, I've got sons now of 19, 17. I'm not sure, I haven't asked them what they would do. I don't know what they would do, but it doesn't seem to me that this would galvanise young people in the same way. No, I think, it's, I think there's a large a chunk of truth in that. I think people, again, going back to my earlier point, almost embarrassed by the fact that we were prepared to do that uh, when we look back from it now. Oh, they are, yeah. It's a result of what happened in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. But also picking up the other point, the government, for under, you know, I don't want to get involved in the political correctness of this, but for, for understandable and inverted commas reasons, the government and a lot of the organisations in this country, the, the um, you know, various departments of state, as well as business and, and, and economics, wanted to try to have a more balanced, um, diverse, you know, diversity and inclusion and so on. So a great effort was made to recruit more women. And I have to say, I was pushing hard to recruit women into the bomb disposal work that I used to do in Northern Ireland because I happen to believe they're very good at it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not against, you know, this diversity piece, but there is a limited number of people, I think, from within um, the women's world, within the diversity world. A lot, of, a lot of overseas countries don't want their children to serve in the military. They want them to be doctors and they want them to be lawyers and, you know, other things too. So there's a limited pool in which we're fishing in to recruit from those communities. Mm. Um, the, the Secretary of State for Defence said he wanted to see 50 per cent of the of the military made up of women. I just don't think that's doable. Whatever one thinks about it, you know, sort of ethically or anything else, I just don't think there is 50 per cent out there that's going to join the military. Yeah. So therefore, the pool we're fishing in is, you know, in a way, the traditional pool that we've always fished from. And, um, and we're struggling to recruit from that pool because of the sort of messages that we're talking about. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, Isabel, I've met plenty of, of, of women who have worked in, in the armed forces and, and very successfully and very bravely. I mean, I know um, a woman who calls herself the, um, the Chinook Chick, who was one of the most famous Chinook pilots, um, flying in and out of hot zones in Afghanistan, rescuing soldiers and, and coming under fire and all the rest of it. And there's nothing wrong uh, with having different genders, different people in, in the army, but this whole kind of wokery thing has taken over. And I also think that an awful lot of the people in this country now have never really seen hardship. You know, we're wealthier now than we've ever been. They don't really know um, what suffering is like and they probably haven't really had much to worry about, which is why I think they all worry about climate change all the time. So, I mean, we're not really ready for war, I suppose, is what my point is. Very, very far from it. And when people hear the figures of the size of our army now, um, those figures need to be reduced really significantly in terms of the size of our army that actually is at any readiness to go to war, as it were. You know, our ability to, to send a division anywhere is highly questionable. Uh, we simply don't have the people. I mean, at any one time, of those 75,000-ish that we are supposedly have in the army, you know, a very significant proportion will not be... Um, fit for frontline duties or, or indeed any duties, quite a lot off sick at any one time. So, yeah, really very, very concerning. Um, and you would have thought and hoped perhaps that the very sort of conventional conflict that's underway in Ukraine um, with Russia uh, would be a reminder that actually wars of the future, the next wars, won't necessarily be those wars in in space or under underwater or you know robotic wars you know they are um you still need people you know mass right. still does matter in the phrase that the military like to use and if you don't have mass then it really very much does matter because your enemy gets you where you're weakest. No, indeed. And I saw you put a tweet out, um, I think yesterday, from Dubai, I think you were, I think you were in Dubai, um, suggesting that the, the slowness of which, uh, with which we build things, in this time it's taken us to build two aircraft carriers, which mostly don't work, um, Dubai has sort of massively expanded into a huge city, which it wasn't the last time I was there. 
I mean, it is just extraordinary. I, I, I spend a lot of time in Dubai and make no apology for continually being wowed by the scale of their achievement. Now, of course, it's different. You know, they are effectively a benign dictatorship and, you know, the those in charge have a big vision mm. and they do what it takes to make it happen. But look, looking over that extraordinary booming metropolis, I just couldn't help thinking, you know, they did all this in the time it took us to build two pretty rusty aircraft carriers mm. that aren't really fit for purpose anymore. And it really does put it in perspective. You know, we're just, it just feels like we lack now a grand vision of who we are and the wherewithal and the determination to make it happen. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and let me come back to you, Major General Tim, for the, last, uh, for the last word, because, I mean, I think Isabel's right, isn't she? We haven't really prepared for the future in lots of different ways in this country. And this is perhaps one of the most dangerous ways that we haven't prepared for the future. I mean, I remember only two or three years ago being told by people in the armed forces, well, of course, you know, old fashioned fighting is never gonna now ever happen again because we've got cyber criminals to worry about. We've got cyber wars to, to fight. And they were recruiting people, uh, you know, who could, who could operate machinery, operate computers. They weren't recruiting fighting men or fighting women at all. And now it's all gone the other way. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. I mean, I, I, it isn't, this is not an easy conversation in one sense because, you know, we're seeing the reality of drones and, you know, technology, the space domain and the drone domain and the cyber domain are, are not... Une, well, they are very important in today's world. But, pick, you know, picking up the earlier point, there is such a thing as critical mass when it comes to people. Yeah. And what we've gone through a period since the Cold War is, to use the phrase that was being used, wars of choice. We could decide whether we wanted to be involved or not. What Patrick Saunders and others are doing, he's not alone in this, senior NATO commanders and, indeed, you know, many politicians are saying that Russia is a serious threat there are serious problems, obviously, in the Middle East, in Ukraine, China and Taiwan, you know, even um, Iran and Pakistan having a crack at each other. So there's a lot of conflict in the world. And people are saying we need to be very careful because we may not be facing a war of choice in three, five, ten years time. We need to be prepared for the fact that we may have to engage, whether we like it much or not, in serious combined arms, land uh, operations as well as navy and, and air operations, and I think what Patrick's trying to do is to you know, make a signal that we need to think about this, and we need to think about how we would uh, mobilise. He's not saying we're going to bring back conscription or anything. He's talking about the size of the regular military, the size of the reserve, and then the ability to bring uh, on board, you know, other people beyond that. If you're going to bring those people on, you need the kit, you need, you know, you need the material, you need the the vehicles and the, and the tanks and the aeroplanes and so mm. forth. Um, so this is an important debate, and you wouldn't expect me, and I did 43 years in the military man and boy, and I am not very happy with the state of the military today. We've had a lot of politicians talking about spending more money, um, and I, I recognise, you know, that there's a problem. I'm going back to Dubai, one of the things they've got is bag shed loads of money. So, yeah. you know, we, we are struggling economically, but if we are going to be serious about this, we're going to have to start spending 2.5%, 3% on defence in, in the not too distant future. Mm. And if Trump gets elected, we're going to be really seriously thinking about the future of NATO in all of this too. Yeah, so, that's... you know, it's a, it's a serious conversation and we need to be making sure that people like Patrick are listened to. Yes. No, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Major General Tim Cross, thank you very much indeed. Isabel Oakeshott as well. I mean, we can't even fix the English Channel at the moment. We can't stop people from coming uh, from France to this country illegally. Uh, one wag on uh, Twitter today suggested perhaps what we should do uh, is make sure that anyone who comes here illegally is immediately conscripted into national service. Somebody else then said, well, hang on a minute. What if you give them all a gun? What will that do? The point is, we need to fix it. And we'll be asking you later on in the show... Uh, if you don't want to fight for your country, then what are you doing here? Why are you even bothering to live in this country? You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up, a nuclear shambles. The UK's flagship Hinkley Point C nuclear plant is hit with further delays and a £35 billion blowout. I'll be blowing up over this madness next. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. 
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr. Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Steve <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, and persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Don't worry, you're not alone. I can't keep up with which storm we're on either. The second one named in a week has well and truly battered much of the UK. Gusts of up to 97 mile per hour, winds swept across the country, causing power cuts for thousands of homes and an awful lot of disrupted travel. And we now welcome a professional to talk about the chaos, meteorologist Steph Agalto. Steph, have you been braving the elements and have you been as confused as everybody else about, you know, where it's all going to end? You know, where does one storm end and another one begin? Well, it ends with some rain and some strong winds and then starts again with some more strong winds and yet more rain. Yes. That seems to be how it is this uh, week, at least. But yes. I've got some good news for you, Mike, actually. Mm, go on. Because it does look like on Friday and Saturday, it might be dry. Really? Don't hold well, do you know what that, I noticed you know, today? <laughs> I came out of the house today and it was really warm. It felt like suddenly spring had sprung. It was about 10 it's degrees strange, warmer. It's strange, isn't it? Because last week was really cold, yeah. very icy, crisp but cold. Um, and then this week it's become milder. It's just because of the direction of the air. It's coming from the southwest this time, dragging in that milder air. But mild at this time of year means cloudy and wet. So yes. that's exactly what we mean. Unfortunately so. So, I mean, have we got any more storms on the horizon? Are we still in the middle of Jocelyn? Has Jocelyn gone? Have we got now, what was it, IJK? Is it Kevin next or Kyle or something like that? Um, Jocelyn has now moved away. It's still breezy. It's still unsettled. But then Friday happens. So we've got to get through Thursday first. Right. But Friday happens. It should be a brighter day. Most of us away from the northwest should be dry, should see some sunshine. It also won't be too cold. And that sticks around for Saturday as well. Right. So that's the good news we have to cling on to. Well, that'd be good news for people flying, because I've never seen anything like the flight paths of some planes the other night when they were just going round and round in circles over Gatwick, some coming in from Ireland and then going back to Ireland, famously the one that came from Scotland going to Paris, uh, where nobody could get off the planes and have their Lucky. passports. I mean, well, yeah, but they couldn't get off the plane. They wouldn't let them out. But, I mean, where do these storms go? So where does Jocelyn go if it leaves the British Joc Isles? Jocelyn has headed over us and is now going sort of over Scandinavia and across the Baltic Sea. That's where it's headed it? now. What do they call it there? Do they give it a name there? Does it call the, the Scandi name? 
<laughs> I think it depends on how bad it is, but normally if someone's named it first, they've got the name. Oh, right, OK. So, so it for comes, Jocelyn's case, So it comes it normally us. from the Bay of Biscay or it comes from the Atlantic and it's named by us and then it goes everywhere else and it's still named Jocelyn. That's quite good. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. In this case, it's all coming from the Atlantic and we can blame it on the US, actually, because it's so cold there. The cold air is dug down and hit that hot air that's always there over yeah. the Gulf of Mexico. And it's that temperature contrast that has triggered our latest batch of storms. So there you go. Yeah, we got, through, we got through Christmas and New Year and most of January without much snow. Is there going to be any more, do you think, or is that it? Well, usually we've got El Nino at the moment in the Pacific and usually that will bring us the the end of winter would be slightly colder than usual, might see some snow then. So, fingers crossed, still get a few outbreaks of colder weather later on this winter. OK, If brilliant. you like it, of course. Otherwise, well, don't cross your fingers. <laughs> well, no, or just go abroad or something and look for something else to do. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. More storms on the way. <laughs> Steph Galter there, uh, meteorologist. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the panel are back with me. Uh, but before that, let's talk about another insight into the insanity currently unfolding across the country. Hinkley Point C, which is Britain's only nuclear power plant under construction, has been delayed by, yes, you guessed it, four years and could cost up to another £46 billion. Pounds. Joining me now, all together, uh, the Telegraph journalist Stephen Edgington, Spikes Online editor Tom Slater and political commentator Candice Holdsworth. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome back. I mean, it's just when you thought you couldn't find anything else that wasn't working terribly well, the one nuclear plant we're building uh, is going to be over budget and late. Just so, like everything else that we ever build. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? It's every single major infrastructure project. Yeah seems to cost tens of billions yeah. of pounds more than when they predicted it and will take tens of years more than when the, yes. again, than, than their original production. So you look at HS2, that's a great right. example. I mean, one good example of something that did happen was the Channel Tunnel, mm. and that was over budget and that was late and everything. Right. But when it happened, we were all quite happy that, it, that it's there. Yes. But I suppose the way that you could also look at this is that the reason why they're always over budget and they're always late is because when the contracts are given out, they give them out to the people that come up with the best deal. So, you know, like if you three, if I asked you three, you know, <laughs> how much will it cost for you to drive me home? And you say five quid, you say 10 quid, you say 15, I go with you and you go, oh, actually it's gonna be 15 in the end because it took longer. <laughs> you know, the reason I gave it to you was because you said it was gonna be five quid. And maybe they should be a bit more robust when they look at, the Scottish Parliament had this problem. Um, they were supposed to be able to build that for something like 10, um, or I think it was 40, 40 million, ended up costing 400 million. You know, 10 times more than it was meant to be. Because they just go, the lowest bid wins, which can't be right, can it? Yeah, I mean, so far the taxpayer's not on the hook for it, but Ross Clark, the energy analyst, was writing in The Spectator, saying he could see a scenario yeah. in four years where the costs just keep mounting and it's spinning out of control that they do a well, deal look where at the HS2, taxpayer... Well, as said. I mean, you can get, bet, bet your bottom dollar this won't be the last we hear of the Hinkley Point... A power plant being over budget. There'll be more over budget reports, I'm sure, in another four years. Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, for sure. I just find it so sad, though. Why can't we build anything? Why are we so incapable yeah. of it? Yeah, and it really doesn't have to be like this either. I mean, <laughs> people were talking about HS2 and how the expense and how long it took. You don't need to go to China where they can, you know, bulldoze any opposition yeah. quite literally if they want yes. to put up a new road or a railway. You just look at France and the amount that it costs them per mile to build a high speed rail track. Yeah. It's. We are just the p peculiar kind of British disease of our age is that you can't build anything. Yes. We've had it taking 40 years and costing you eight times as much as you were but quoted must, in the I first mean, place. It, 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 I guess it must have always been like this, in our, certainly in your lifetimes. I mean, my life... I can't remember the last massive infrastructure thing that was built that was, that was tremendously good, really. I mean, I remember when they were building motorways, when there wasn't, you know, there wasn't an M6 and there wasn't an M5. Mm. And most of those roads haven't really been updated since they were built. When was that, 50s, 60s? 70s, I think, a lot of them. 70s and, and you know, some, some like the M25 was immediately obsolete as soon as they finished it, you know, because there was too much traffic already for what they wanted it to, to do. It's interesting, on the point about nuclear power stations, yeah. these things are long-term projects mm. that politicians should be investing in from, a long, you know, from originally a long time ago. So yeah. Nick Clegg is one of those politicians who said mm. in 2010, I think, yes. 
we can't build he another was, nuclear he was power very station. With himself, wasn't he? Because it would be done by 2024, 2023. Right. And it's like, well, I wish we had that power now. Right. Yeah. And As also, if it was the distant future, you know, yeah, from exactly. science fiction. Mm. Or something. I think it's, it's to do also with the kind of huge amount of regulations that have been introduced mm. in the last decade or so, particularly around diversity and right. energy. And there's a huge amount of local opposition against Hinkley Point as well. So, yeah. again, it's this kind of nimby mm. attitude yes. that has gripped Britain. And I've spoken to people involved in HS2, and many of them say things like, you know, if you, again, if you're a contractor um, and you're em employed by, by the people building HS2, you basically double whatever you would charge anybody else. Yes. And they just pay it because it's kind of government funding and nobody's really watching how much is going out the door. And the bureaucracy is just strangling the productivity. And you see this in so mm. many areas of life now. I mean, the difference between the public and the private sector in terms yeah. of productivity is just growing and growing yeah. and growing. I know. Absolutely incredible. Mm. My favourite story of the day... Um, there's a bit of a row that's grown up between the US and Britain about tea. Now, I don't know whether you've seen this one, um, but apparently it was all started by a, a doctor in uh, Pennsylvania, Dr Michelle Frankel, who studies interstellar chemistry uh, at a college in Pennsylvania. Basically, she conducts research into tea in her spare time, and she suggested that a tiny pinch of salt <laughs> could remove the bitterness from a cup of tea uh, that has been over-brewed. Now, horrifically, I heard Piers Morgan coming on to his show earlier, um, and before he went on, he was talking to Rosanna about how to make the perfect cup of tea. He apparently puts four tea bags into a pot <laughs> of tea uh, and leaves it to stew um, and then pours it into a cup. Doesn't believe in just putting tea in, a tea bag into a cup. I know there are purists who don't believe in tea bags at all. Um, <laughs> but it's amazing what can work, uh, work people up into a frenzy. The US Embassy in London actually put out a statement uh, <laughs> saying, today's media reports of an American <laughs> professor's recipe for the perfect cup of tea has landed our special bond with the United Kingdom in hot water. Mm. And it's quite funny, because obviously the tea party uh, is all about uh, whatever it is. The US, it says, the US Embassy will continue to make tea in the proper way by microwaving it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, only the Americans would suggest. So how do you have your tea? I have my tea completely black. Do no you? sugar, right. no milk. No lemon that, or anything? I quite like the bitterness of it, actually. Okay. I think that's quite... I like the strong taste, it kind of wakes you up in the yeah. morning a little bit. Also, I saw the Cabinet Office, the UK Cabinet Office, tweeted against the American embassy saying, you can only have tea if it's made from a kettle. Yes. And I don't think that's right either. I think, you know, there's lots of other different ways of making well, tea. Well, I suppose, I mean, it. if you're posh enough to have one of those very hot mm. water taps, which yeah. I think uh, they have in various hotels and things like that, I still think a kettle is the best way to boil mm. water. I don't think I don't think those hot water taps. I'm too lazy. I quite like that instant tap. Have that you got? You haven't tap. got one at home. I haven't got one at home. I'm not that rich. No, at, I mean rich people offices. have got them at home. I'm always terrified <laughs> I would get up in the middle of the night and put it on and scald myself <laughs> because I would have thought it was cold. But you know, um, yeah, I've always liked weak tea. When I was at university, we once had a um, a tea marathon to raise <laughs> money for um, to raise money for some charity or other, Brag Week. And we all drank pints and pints and pints of tea mm. to such an extent that we are putting ice in it to drink it. And it was yeah. the weirdest thing. It was like we were all very high <laughs> after drinking, an awful, I guess, an awful lot of caffeine. I think the record was somebody drank about 15 pints of tea in the course of about two hours. Sounds like the hours. sort of thing that could actually give you, send you to the hospital without realising, <laughs> you know, if you well, consume anything that's kind of about. stupid thing to do, too. I mean, you know, they're supposed to be... The, but at the, no the, point uh, the pinch of salt that came into it, which well, is... Is this just... Is it only Americans who suggest this? I mean, to be fair to them, after you see what Americans have done to both cheese and chocolate, yes. go over there, you can't well, really trust them with any kind of... they do very things, don't they, with food? They kind yeah. of mix things. There's like... There's the, the, who's, I think there's a name for it, but it's like a cross between a donut and a bagel. <laughs> I don't know what it's called, but it's horrific. Um, but also, maybe this is that, you know, that kind of co the, the, the craze now for putting salt with chocolate? You know, sort of chocolate car caramel. I quite like that. Like caramel, that. Which does work, yeah. Can I reveal a, li a, bit, of, a bit of a tea fact in go the on. studio? Please do. Now, I've heard a little rumour that mm. this perhaps isn't <laughs> Whiskey, really? And then it may be another liquid. Is that is that maybe right? I, don't I know. couldn't possibly. You couldn't possibly, possibly comment. Well, I mean, because I mean, this is inside the secret <laughs> life of the independent. Republic and do you know, I can right tell you another, another. This is how stories appear in newspapers. There's know, another secret. Somebody confirms something. <laughs> <laughs> there's another good tea fact I've got about not this show, but another yeah. show on, the, on 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 talk TV. Yes. And that's Julia Hartley Brewer. Very quick, quick anecdote. I used to I interned for her once a long, long time ago when I was a teenager. You don't look smart. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she loved. her her tea very, very weak, like you. Oh, really? And I used to have to get her... You know, her... it's interesting, because I think she comes from Bath, and I was at uni in Bath, 
Maybe it's a bath thing. Have you ever had the water in Bath? It's disgusting. The, the water in the well, broken yeah, bath. Yeah, I have, yeah. Oh, God, it's Well, horrible. you're not supposed to drink it. You're supposed <laughs> you to, sw it. You're supposed you to sit in it. it. <laughs> I mean, you go in there and they give you a glass of it to drink. It's, yeah, you're not... Maybe that's why it. she likes weak tea, I don't know. Ooh. But I used to have to fetch her her cups of tea. Yeah. I used to, and she said it was never weak enough. And right. I used to pour milk and endless milk, endless really? milk. And one time I just was like, oh, I'm going to build you, just give you milk. Yeah. And she, and she thought it was... She didn't think it was that funny, actually. Fascinating. Yeah, I, remember, <laughs> I remember as a child being... We used to go off to... In driving across European cars and things, and I could always be baffled when you'd turn up in some place in Germany and you'd ask for milk. My parents would ask for milk with the tea because it was always in a glass mm. with one of those little copper uh, handled, you know, uh, rings or something. And, and they'd bring hot milk out, and you'd just be like, What's wrong with you? Mm. You know, um, very strange. <laughs> anyway, I told you that's the most exciting story of the night. Um, <laughs> shall we talk about 99% um, mortgages? Because that's going to be a thing, apparently. Um, I don't remember when they did used to have them, but they did apparently used to have 99% mortgages in this country, but they stopped quite a long time ago. But in the days when you could actually afford to buy a house, I heard, I think, today that the average house price in London is now 750000 which is bonkers. Um, but I worry about this because this is how the whole subprime problem yes. started, when they started giving money to people who couldn't really afford to borrow <laughs> that kind of money based on the fact that, oh, well, house prices will just continue to go up. Yeah. I remember reading stories in America about, you know, bus drivers getting $500,000 loans to buy houses in Maryland outside of Washington, mm. D.C., and then suddenly the house price fell mm. and, and they couldn't pay anybody back. Yeah, well, it's a recipe rates. for disaster, isn't it? No, no, Yeah, definitely. well, interest rates going up, and, I mean, you're totally over-leveraged on a house that costs an absolute fortune. Yeah. I mean, this is only going to increase demand as well and not supply. Right. So house prices are going to get even more expensive. Right. People are going to end up with these huge... Huge mortgages that they don't pay off until they're like yeah. in the 60s or 70s. I mean, why do you think it is that people <laughs> in Britain see buying houses as such a kind of <clears throat> must do activity? You know, because an awful lot of places around the world, people don't do it. Yeah. Quite happy to rent for most of their lives and quite happy not to own a property. You know, I mean, I understand why people would like to pass it on to their kids and everything, but, but nowadays, if you, go, if you do live to a ripe old age and you end up having to go into a care home, you have to sell the house anyway to pay mm. for it. It feels like quite a safe investment, putting your money into housing. Yeah. Like, even though there has been house price crashes and everything with yeah. bubbles and stuff, I mean, generally over the years, the price has gone up. Mm. And it seems, what does seem mad is that, as you say, they're not dealing with the demand and supplies issue, issue here. Right. Like, we're, we're importing, what, 750,000 people net in 2022? Mm. Those people all have to buy homes. Yeah. Why aren't the government dealing well, with that? Well, all that has issue? to be supplied with yeah. a home of some kind. Well, exactly. And so, it all has a knock-on effect for the rental sector as well, yeah. doesn't it? Of course, because that's one thing where people, um, particularly as they reach a ripe old age, get into retirement, owning your own home and having it basically paid off is a fantastic thing to have. That's one thing they've started to look at because of the number of people who will probably never buy a house yes. as a consequence, much in much lower levels than previous generations. <clears throat> That's become a big problem for the state at some point because right. they're going to still be in rented accommodation. And how is that going to be supplied in enough measure? Are they going to need need support in order to continue that into their old age when they right. haven't got income beyond a pension. Well, that's the so thing. A lot yes. of all of these knock-on effects will have a very, you know, they'll be sort of rich because they've got a house that's worth a lot of money, mm -hmm. but they live in it, so they can't really sell it mm -hmm. unless they're going to sell it and downsize and, and pocket the rest of the money. Similarly, you might even see Keir Starmer, because Labour have talked about this before, changing the way the council tax is, is done and actually start charging you based on, you know, the size of the house that you've got and making you pay extra, you know, depending on how big it is, which for a lot of people they can't afford because they've just, they happen to have a big house, mm -hmm. but they haven't got any money. They're cash poor but right. asset rich. And this yeah. is so common now, and people kind of see it as an investment for the future and something to pass on to their children. But then, like you say, if there's increasing numbers of people renting, you kind of think we're returning to the time before there was a lot of people owning property and people didn't have anything to pass on to their children. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that's been such a big thing in, like, the last 50, 60 years, that people did have something, that you had something to inherit. But I wonder if that will become less and less as home ownership declines. Yeah, absolutely right. Just have a look at a couple of the quick uh, front page stories. We were talking about the post office earlier today. Um, I, the I newspaper's got post office new second IT system had faults but prosecuted the staff anyway. Brilliant. It's nice, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy. It's one of those things where at every turn they seem to know that this had gone wrong. Yeah. Because there was all the reports recently of, of course, when, you know, the sub-postmasters started launching their campaign, they must have realised then, or, look, we found this kind of internal briefing which showed that Paula Venels was aware of what had taken place. This goes right back to when the scandal began because right. the original IT system was for something completely different. Mm. It failed, they repurposed it 
for the sub postmaster's accounting. Right. So they knew from the very beginning that it didn't work, and right. yet they still carried on with it. Is that yeah. Outrageous? And then it carried on with these what are you would call malicious prosecutions, really. Mm -hmm. And Tony Blair had the opportunity in the late 90s to actually stop this system yes. being used, and he didn't do it. And it seems that throughout this whole process, this 20, 30 year mm. period, no one is taking responsibility for the crisis here. No one has gone to prison or gone to, or been prosecuted for these false prosecutions. Yeah. Why is no one taking any responsibility? Why well, I remember seeing a clip a couple of weeks ago when we were doing this story for the first time of Tony Blair standing up talking about how great this was going to be and how revolutionary it was going to be mm -hmm. and how it was going to completely change everybody's lives because this was the new way forward, you know, because he was always pushing this whole, you know, we're now digital, we're not analogue anymore, you know, Britain's modernised under Blair, which they did, but, I mean, this was clearly a massive, massive blunder. A mm. um, couple of th other things. Captain Tom Moore's family, you'll be sad to hear, um, have got the builders moving in to demolish the £1 million spa. They can't catch a break, course... can they? They've got that charity commission investigation yeah. ongoing, which of which I'll say nothing. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's one... Bad news story after another. For I mean, can you imagine what they must be doing now, sitting in watching the builders just demolishing <laughs> this place that they built? Presumably they spent quite a lot of money on it yes. and they won't get any back, presumably. I mean, no. I know uh, you might argue it wasn't really their money to begin with, but still, um, it's <laughs> pretty They can't awful. catch a break, can they? They're just they trying to set up can't. a nice charitable <laughs> endeavour and this is what happened. I know. But, I mean, all they had to do was build a smaller kind of, you know, edifice <laughs> as opposed to something that was big I enough. I think this is an example of decadence and greed and they yeah. should take responsibility for this, you know... There is a certain arrogance, Roman -esque, that some people, a certain arrogance that some people kind of adopt or, have, or, or become where they think they can just get away with anything. But the contrast between the two generations, I mean, could you get them further apart? Mm. He's all about sacrifice yeah. and community and they're just like, I'm going to build a huge spa for myself. Yeah. <laughs> It's what he would have wanted. <laughs> specifically not what he wanted, because he actually said in the forwards of the book that he wanted the money to go to charity. But anyway, uh, listen, we've got loads more to do, loads more front pages to do. You're watching The Independent Republic uh, for Mike Graham. It is the all-too-familiar story coming up, though. Go woke, go broke. We had Budweiser, Victoria's Secret. We'll get ready for this one. Uh, it's the woke bikini manufacturer who decided it's with a bloke in a swimsuit. Now that and a load more coming next. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it goes. 
I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for the World of Woke. The World of Woke. It's an all-too-familiar story. Go woke, go broke. Who can forget the Budweiser millions that went south when the US beer company decided it'd be a great idea to use trans model Dylan Mulvaney to flog their wares. So much money was wiped off their share price, they had to sack the marketing executives. Then there was Victoria's Secret, who gave up on the idea of using plus-size models on their catwalk lingerie shows because people just stopped buying their bras and knickers. You'd think it would be common sense, wouldn't you? Only last week, US magazine Sports Illustrated laid off their entire staff because sales had plunged so much after they put a trans woman on the cover in a swimsuit just one year ago. Well, this week's woke numpties are another swimsuit manufacturer. Not only have they put a bloke in a woman's bikini, they've decided to attack their own customers for complaining about it. Incredible, isn't it? The message from the Aussie Mona bikini brand is that if you object to a man strutting around a pool, hiding his crown jewels and pouting at the camera, you might be the problem. According to the firm's founder, Karina Irby, she's all about body, body positive images. She says she's obsessed with the look of the guy in the one piece and wants everyone to splash out £80 for one of them. But the customers of the 13-year-old business aren't so enthusiastic. Lots of them posted on social media that they were done with the brand. One said, I thought you were all about empowering women. But here's the message Mona replied with. If Jake in our bikini upsets you that much, we feel as though this may be a you problem. Oh, dear. And to make matters worse, Jake has chipped in as well. He says, there are many different types of women, women with different anatomy to what you consider normal. Yeah, that's right, Jake. There are many different types of women, and you're not one of them. And what have you done with your balls? I'm just asking, because when you look from the front, they're not there, and when you look from the back, they're not there either. That's the world of woke. The world of woke. Woke. Um, that's a bit of a weird one, that, isn't it? Um, I don't know if you could see when he was strutting there. He's definitely got them tucked in um, when he's looking at it from the front. Um, but when you see him from the back, they're not there either. So it's quite a... It sounds like you've done a forensic analysis, Mike. <laughs> well, as, as ever, with every story that I cover, I research it thoroughly to make sure <laughs> I know every angle that is going on here. But, uh, well, maybe maybe it doesn't happen. I, mean, I don't know, really. I think there's a whole art to tucking. Is there? Yes. Yes, I'm sure there is. Yes. I don't think we should explore that tonight, though. <laughs> Luckily, we haven't got time. Um, the Times and the Telegraph and uh, the, um, I think, Metro as well, all leading with the Citizens' uh, Army that uh, has been asked for by General Sir Patrick Sanders. Scooping the Telegraph last night, um, Steve, so we'll have to tip our hats to you. But the Times have said the UK should have Citizen Army to see off Russia. Um, Telegraph, similarly, Prime Minister forced to rule out an army draft as the Russian threat rises. It's interesting, isn't it? Because proper story. Rishi Sunak in the past has has uh, shown frustration at senior military leaders mm. going out and making comments like this. Yeah. And he's actually told them, please don't do this right. because you're going off on sort of a side project that Rishi isn't interested in. Clearly, and I think they've clearly overstepped the mark here. Because I'm sorry, why should British people being prepared being prepare themselves for war with Russia? What's mm. I don't understand the eventuality. Well, I mean, we said it last night as we read out the actual words from the Telegraph, and I said, you know, I said, I can't believe I'm quite so calmly reading this that you know that we have to prepare for war with Russia. I'm sorry, uh, when did that happen? You know, how did we suddenly escalate from you know giving some arms and a few billion quid to Ukraine to suddenly the Russians arriving on the front doorstep? <sighs> and I mean, what a terrifying prospect! Mm. You look at any point in history. The Russians have always undone any ambitious military campaign, from Napoleon to Hitler. Who has beaten them? Right. 
They're quite good. Well, I suppose they didn't win in Afghanistan, but then nobody wins in Afghanistan. See, that was interesting. Yeah. Yes. And even they had to leave and, 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 and get over all that. But what was the feeling about this uh, draft? Because obviously everybody's been talking about it here at Talk TV today. Would you fight for your country? You know, I said earlier that I wanted to go and fight uh, in the Falklands because I was that enthused about the whole idea of it. Um, I get the sense now that a for younger people now are not that keen. It's interesting, isn't it? I think the connection that younger people have to their country is very different to mm. what it was, say, in 1939, before the Second yeah. World War. And I think patriotism has declined. If you look at any opinion polls, yeah. I think that's quite clear. Right. And it's understandable in some ways, because you think, well, the, the, my country, does it support me anymore, my, the establishment? Well, what government? does it stand for? Even? Well, exactly. I mean, min military leaders, um, not just in the UK, but in the United States, mm. for example, have talked about things like white rage. Yeah. And they've got this big recruitment crisis where white men basically aren't signing up to the armed forces. Actually, this is a story I'm working on The Telegraph this week, so right. you'll see it at the weekend. Um, so I think, look, I, I can think it's understandable that some people are saying, well, why should I fight for these people when they hate me anyway? Yeah. People are bemused by this, but look at the diet of propaganda that these young people are fed when they go through mm. schooling or whatever. To be a patriot is to be something akin to an extremist in mm. certain circles. You're more yeah. likely to be... Um, referred to prevent them, that's yes. congratulated. So it really shouldn't be a surprise that we turn around and wonder yeah. why young people are and so... And we get universities banning, you know, um, military recruitment offices from, from, from mm. recruitment fairs and from jobs fairs, don't we? So I suppose we shouldn't be surprised. Um, but, uh, but there we are. That's a bit, bit of royal action. Uh, sun, front, sun page four and five, a bit on the front. Um, Harry and Meghan pose up with leaders in Jamaica. Apparently, they've gone back to Jamaica. They've been on a holiday for a while. They're probably worn out uh, from all those awards they've been receiving. Um, I don't know whether he flew himself in one of John Travolta's jets now that he's an aviation legend, <laughs> um, Harry. Uh, but they've sparked a new royal row because they're hobnobbing, basically, with Jamaican politicians who are plotting to end the king's rule. I, I mean, in the same week that he's going in for prostate surgery. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Is it a gaffe? Timing is everything. But is it a gaffe or...? I don't think anything they do is is by accident. It seems to me they spend an awful lot of time trying to work out exactly what will be the effect of what they're about to do, and they then do it. Yeah, they'll never move on. That would I mean, be their it brand didn't occur forever. to me until somebody actually pointed it out. But when Harry went to the Aviation Legends Award ceremony, she didn't turn up because they had a sick child, and somebody said to me, "Oh yeah, that'll be because Kate's not well." And it suddenly went. You suddenly go, "Wow, that's actually quite." Um, they're quite calculated. Quite calculated and, and, and quite sort of, I don't know, complicated thinking. But then they That's kind of, true. I'm not convinced they can kind of play PR 3D chess to quite the same degree. I mean, especially because so many of the attempts at making headlines has backfired so spectacularly because, you know, Megan claims that she was congratulated by various South Africans on her nuptials <laughs> and then the South Africans in question can't remember this no. conversation. No, no. So, uh, there, there is often the case that they try and get a news line out there and then it's almost immediately rebutted by the yes. thing we call the truth. Well, I mean, so I think knows, that was but... the beginning of the end for them when they suddenly started talking about this high-speed car chase in Manhattan, <laughs> um, where there was literally a cab driver telling them that, you know, actually, no, it wasn't high-speed at all. And, and, and here's some footage of them not going very far <laughs> down a road and turning right. Well, to be fair to them, if they want us to be talking about them and giving them press, I mean, we are doing it right now, aren't we? We are. They're always very good at that. But and I don't think they like it when we make fun of them, though. That's true. And it's interesting, as we're talking about making fun of them. It's interesting because they've gone to this um, this Bob Marley kind of yeah. premiere of this film or something. Yeah. Oh, there's and I know a new that, Bob Marley film coming out. Right, and, and Harry, you know, he said in his book, I think, that he's very much into drugs in some ways. I think he's sort of dabbled in yes. it. So I don't know whether they're going to be doing any of that in... in well, there'll certainly be some ganja available. I'm sure that's one of the reasons they're enjoying living in California so much, because it's, you know, it's not illegal there. He... Prince, Prince Harry is a bit of a kind of tragic, overgrown gap year kid. He is. I think that explains yeah. a lot when you really think he's about it. He's the kind of guy that when he turns up, everybody goes, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. You know, what's he going to want to do now? But he used to be fun. He did. I preferred his period when he was playing pool naked with strippers in Las Vegas. I know, and he you know, was, was far more entertaining. His earlier work. Yeah, his <laughs> earlier work. Yeah. That's your more, more Before your he discovered style. therapy. Yeah. You know. That's the thing. I mean, he's never been the same since he went to a therapist. No. Unbelievable. Um, speaking of Americans, uh, Trump trounces imposter Haley as he takes battle to Biden. Um, the world spread in the Times, pages 26 and 27. I mean, nobody really thought Nikki Haley had much of a chance, but they thought if she was going to have any chance, she would at least have to win New Hampshire. Mm. Yeah. But she lost. Because of all the independence there and because of the fact that politically it's a much more sort of purple state. Mm. But the fact that she's fallen so far behind, I just think it shows how out of touch that old Republican yeah. establishment is. Yeah, she these very are the much... anti-Trumpers, aren't they? Exactly. Yeah. She was very much their candidate. They just don't recognise it's not their party anymore. No. no. The populist wing are They've the lost. ascendancy. It's and all over. They need to yeah. get used to it. I wonder if the Conservative Party could else. learn something from that because, you know, 
we keep hearing the likes of, as I say, to, uh, Tobias Elwood saying, you know, come, uh, elections are won in the centre ground. Well, not anymore, they're not. Not in Italy, mm. you know, possibly not in Germany, possibly not in France. Not no. in Spain. And Do what they mean by the centre not ground in America. is never well, they mean what it sounds like anyway. Sort yeah. of, you know, centre... Them. <laughs> middle, left, right, yeah. you know, sort of, we don't really... We're not too sure. It's funny because I, I've been speaking to some Conservative MPs, mm. even tonight, actually, a, a sort of burns night thing, and they were talking about Trump, and uh, he's actually very popular among some yeah. senior Conservative MPs, weirdly. They never say it publicly, no. but privately they're saying... Well, I think they'll quite start like what saying it the more yeah. it becomes clear that he's going to be the president, because I think he is, because I'll show you something now which should scare the bejesus out of anybody who wants to see another four years from Biden. Here he is last night thanking everybody, but nobody's quite sure what he had to say. We'll teach Donald Trump a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the men in America unless you want to get the benefit. I, I think he said, can we see that again? Just for the comic effect. No, we can't, apparently. Uh, they don't have a sense of humour behind the, the glass. Um, he's, I think he's saying, don't mess with cent mid middle America. <laughs> What's the end of it? Unless you want to get the benefit, which doesn't make... Anything. Well, that doesn't make any sense either. Yeah. Surely. Do you know what's even funnier? Is that when he was saying that, everyone was clapping behind him. It yeah. was like some sort of Soviet thing where, you know, <laughs> Stalin's making a speech. <laughs> Everyone's clapping. Yes, yeah, like, yeah. Whoever isn't clapping is going to be I think they're actually in order to clap to drown out what he's saying. Yeah. So you can't actually hear that he's messing up all I the words. I can't wait for those debates. Donald Trump, Fantastic. valuable lesson. Don't mess with the men in America unless you want to get the better. <laughs> No. Oh, it's brilliant. I mean, I used to do a, a, a thing called the, the Biden balls up every week on the um, um, the, the world according to Mike Graham. But it got it was so easy to do. We just gave up on it. Mm. it was the one, there was about ten to choose from every single week, you know, including of course the one where he fell flat on his face. We've seen that Naval Academy thing. Um, interesting on the front of the Times, this one about Blair and Haig apparently are talking about selling NHS data to boost AI treatments. Now, I slightly worry about things like this when I read them. Former Labour Prime Minister and former Conservative leaders say that harnessing the coming revolution in biotechnology and artificial intelligence should become a new national purpose. Mm. They actually want to go back into records, I presume, that they've got of people and sell them. Yeah, it depends who it goes to. I mean, I remember during the lockdown... Yeah, well, who gets the money? I know. But I got a letter from someone who got hold of my data from the GP oh, yeah. trying to scare me, saying I was incredibly vulnerable to COVID because I was pregnant at the time. No. I mean, it was totally against medical advice. Didn't they have various different pieces of advice for pregnant women? Because yes. at first they said you shouldn't get vaccinated. Then they yeah. said you should get vaccinated. Yeah, then there was did. a lot of people who were sort of up in arms about the idea of yes. getting vaccinated. Yes. And a lot of women I know who were pregnant just didn't, no, didn't I know take loads. it. But they came under huge pressure. Mm. I mean, I had a, a friend who worked as a, a nurse at a GP's and it, she came under massive pressure to get vaccinated. It was really difficult. Yeah, I know, it is tough. Front page of the Mirror's good as well. They've come face to face with the gastric op death surgeon, mm. which is just a great headline apart from anything else. This is the guy in Turkey who performed weight loss surgery uh, on a British woman who died. So many British women are going to Turkey to get things done mm. and terrible things are happening to them. Well, it's not just the women. I think you, if you go back on a plane from, from Turkey or something, you look at the, the heads of the men on the... Oh, really? Have they all had transplants? Oh, they've all had transplants. Really? Honestly, look, they're all like little oh, dots God. on red. It's horrible. That absurdly and the teeth... straight line across the top of the forehead, like you know something's been... <laughs> exactly. And they also replace all their teeth. Have you seen the weird yeah. new teeth thing? So they get like these teeth that are completely straight, right. totally white, and they all get that from Turkey as well. Oh, so God. Turkey does some really... But those that teeth is really dodgy as well. Don't get that. No, it only lasts I certainly a couple wouldn't. Of years. No, I would never go to Turkey <laughs> to get anything other than a kebab, I think, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, the final, uh, final word on Rishi Sunak. He's apparently got six weeks to save his premiership. Um, nobody's surprised by I think that. He's got no weeks to save it. Yeah, him. I think he's got no weeks. I don't think you can save it. I think that's it for him. Anyway, um, that's all from me tonight. You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you uh, to all of my guests. I'll see you tomorrow night at 9 pm, only, of course, on the place to be is Talk TV. Good night. for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones.
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> it's like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, <laughs> brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden 